Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos, where leaders discuss what's coming next in satellites and space. Welcome to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. My name is John Gilroy. I'll be your moderator today. Our guest today is Michael Abad Santos, Senior Vice President, LeoSat. Michael, how are you? I'm doing great, John. How are you doing? Well, you're a local fellow. Glad to have a local fellow here in Washington, D.C. We're at Satellite 2018, all kinds of exciting things going around here. If you met someone at the show here, give us a little 10-second introduction to what your company does. So LeoSat is a new satellite company that is launching uh, 84 satellites into low Earth orbit with a focus on high throughputs, low latency, high secure communications. Oh, Constellations, huh? An amazing term. It's a great name. I I think we got that from something around here. (laughs) Yeah, the Constellations podcast. Well, I'm going to ask you the tough question now. Uh, I've done a lot of interviews with people in software development, and they talk about open source software, and you think of free software. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a concept here called free space optical communications. So so what what does that mean when it comes to your company, free space optical communications? Free space optics is just a fancy way to say lasers. Mm -hmm. So lasers in space, that's what we're doing. Um, Now, we are doing, the best way to put it is uh, free space optics or optical intersatellite links uh, just represent a portion of the technology that we're putting on the satellites. Um, We are using the free space optics or laser comm to interconnect our constellation of satellites in space. The way I like to say is we're taking a terrestrial fiber-like system, converting it to laser, and launching it up into space so we have a seamless global backbone. So what is the advantage of this seamless backbone? So the advantage of that is you can actually deliver data from any point on the world to any other point on the world seamlessly, quickly, um, at a much lower cost than you could if you were uh, burying traditional um, terrestrial or, or submarine fiber cables. So, you know, I always like to say it's the easiest way to bring global fiber connectivity to the world is through space and interconnecting those nodes in space and allowing the transfer. So this company was founded in 2013. Someone had this vision for next year, for 2019, for six years out. So our founder is a gentleman by the name of Cliff Anders, and his background is he was at Schlumberger, and he was responsible for all the internal networking um, across Schlumberger. And they were large consumers of commercial satellite capability. And what he found was that the traditional... Uh, geo and FSS uh, satellite networks weren't optimal for the applications that he was trying to run. So after he left Schlumberger, he came up with the idea of LeoSat, which is to, it was designed to provide enterprise level connectivity to enterprise grade customers. So banks, health insurance companies, uh, the U.S. government. Um, so our, our mission is really focused on enterprise grade customers um, and and providing high quality secure services. So I went to your website and you talk about uh, some unique characteristics. Um, one unique is the polar orbit. That's different then, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so right now the only real um, global player in the satellite space is Iridium, as you know. Um, they're operating a current network and they're, they're launching their next constellation, the Iridium Next constellation. Like Iridium, uh, we are providing a full global network, so we communicate at the poles. We're looking forward to uh, working with the National Science Foundation um, as one of our, our launch customers to uh, provide services down at the McMurdo uh, station down at the South Pole. But clearly, you know, if you look at uh, what's happening in the, the in the northern latitudes and North Pole and the the northern shipping routes? There's lots of activity going up there, um, so it's a great opportunity for us to be able to solve those communication issues. So, uh, Walker, on the show here at Satellite 2018, um, I would think that the differentiator that you have is the combination of low latency and, and the speed, the gigabyte speed. That's the advantage of this type of network. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a really high throughput network. We have 84 satellites, as I said. We have our standard user spot beams that do 1.6 gigabits per second in, in synchronous communication or bidirectional. Our high capacity beams actually do 5.2 gigabits per second. So we're talking about really large uh, data capacity that we can transit um, at really low latencies. So in terms of latency, if you're in the same area of operation, you can go up and down in, in less than 19 milliseconds round trip time. We have routes that are from London to Singapore that are 119 milliseconds. Wow, and if you look at the, the current submarine cables, the fast 
closest terrestrial cable route is 198 milliseconds. So we're, we have an improvement upon terrestrial fiber. I was walking on the show earlier, and I was talking to a gentleman who owns a company, CEO of a company over here. He has a Ph.D. from Berkeley in, like, mathematics, so he understands a lot of these concepts. And a lot of people on this, this, this show here understand this concept. So I'm going to throw this out to you. This is basic, but maybe you can run with it. So there's, there's RF communications. There's optical. So give us the strengths and weaknesses of both of these. These are the big the general categories you're talking about here. RF versus optical, please. So I'm a philosophy major, so I will do my best to... To, to quote Aristotle, some, <laughs> where Aristotle designed RF. <laughs> yeah, so I'll do my best to, to, to take some uh, fairly complex uh, topics and, and simplify them. But in essence, uh, free space optics and RF are, are very similar. They just use different segments of the electromagnetic spectrum. So when we're talking about free space optics or lasers, you're talking around usually 150 to 400 terahertz. Uh, whereas, you know, we're operating in uh, KA band, which is at, you know, the 28 gigahertz range. It's all just different parts of the same thing. So if optical is such an improvement, why is it taking so long to commercialize? I mean, I think this technology has been around since the 90s, hasn't it? Um, actually, I think the very first optical network was in the 1960s. Um, even earlier. Yeah. So even actually, you know. One could argue that the very first optical link might have been a signal fire. So, <laughs> well, it does go back to Aristotle. <laughs> yeah, you know, Stone Age times. So, um, optical has been around for quite a while. It's a it's a well proven technology. It's used in a lot of terrestrial applications. It's ideally suited for space, especially for the way we're implementing it in terms of interconnecting our satellites. Lasers perform better in vacuum and free space without any kind of atmospheric. Uh, interference as opposed to trying to go from, you know, space to ground. So it's an ideal solution for us. It also helps with our security footprint. It's very, laser links are very hard to uh, intercept because of the, the diameter of the tightly focused beams. So it's, you know, from a cybersecurity perspective, it's a much smaller threat surface. I've been involved in software for many years now, and years ago I would study these tests, and I'd have to study about border gateway protocol, BGP. BGP. It's yeah. a big deal. And you had to learn all these things, and you take the test and you move on. And uh, the word gateway is kind of interesting, especially in regards to your company. Um, I, I think the way I understand is that gateways are not a prerequisite for LeoSat to operate your network. So it allows for premises-to-premises -premises connections with no terrestrial touch point in between. Now, now that is different. That is new. Hmm? That's absolutely correct. And it's, once again, it is something that we took into account. And if you think about LeoSat, what we're really trying to do is provide point-to-point -point connectivity in the most efficient and secure and seamless way. So by utilizing the laser backbone um, on the spacecraft, we are able to create a network in which we do not need extensive ground teleport infrastructure in order to land and route traffic. Um, so not only do we have the, the lasers on the, on the satellite, we have onboard processors that perform routing functions, uh, routing and switching functions. So what we've done is we've created a really secure, robust communications and switching infrastructure that does not rely on terrestrial gateways. Uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago that in, in outer space, the you know, light's kind of in a pure environment. However, you know, I think that optical signals are subject to atmospheric turbulence. And uh, so how do, you, how do you handle issues like atmospheric issues? Can a bird get in its way? Can a blimp get in the way? Or how do you handle something like that? We don't have those issues at our altitude. So uh, our satellites are operating at 1,400 kilometers. So we won't have birds or hopefully we won't have birds. At what kind of birds up there? <laughs> Not the organic kind, that's for sure. Um, so we we don't have those atmospheric scintillation issues. Now that does become an issue if you were doing um, laser from space to Earth. Clearly, you would have to yeah. yeah you you would have to account for those uh, for those issues. And the way to do that is you build a more robust ground infrastructure. So you have to build more ground gateways in order to do that so you can find a different area that does not have the extensive cloud cloud coverage or has free atmospherics. Yeah, th this is a, the challenge of doing a podcast is that if I had a whiteboard here, you could <laughs> diagram it out and I say, oh, I get it. So it's not going from Earth. It's going from one point in space to another point in space. And so it can leverage that. It doesn't have to really worry about much atmospheric conditions because it's doesn't need no stinking atmosphere. Uh, that's way out there. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, we do utilize RF, so KA band frequencies for our space to Earth um, 
links. So that's how we are, we're doing that. We're not doing laser from Space Star. Washington Nationals are going to start playing pretty soon. They're talking about making trades, and, and sometimes a trade will complement the team, actually fit in well with the team. So are you developing something to replace RF satellite communications or complement them? or, or what's the, what, Is it a competitive world, or where do you, where do you start in regards to RF? I mean, as I just said, RF is a part of our current constellation, and you know we think it's the most effective way to do space to Earth communications at this point. Um, the 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 laser optics are the most efficient way to carry data across a space satellite network. Uh, and do that really efficiently. But in terms of space to Earth, RF is always going to be here, in, in my belief. And it's a much more uh, weather-friendly frequency than, than laser and, and optics as well. So Before the show, you told me you had a degree in economics and philosophy. So I know you heard of uh, Clayton Christensen. <laughs> and he uses this term disruptor a whole lot. Mm-hmm. And so my question is, is this technology going to be a disruptor? I don't think the technology, the the components themselves are disruptors. I think the method in which we are putting all the parts and pieces is really a disruptor. So everything that we're putting on the satellites has been space proven. The the optical links are space proven. The the RF links are space proven. We have a great partner in Talus who is uh, has a space proven um, satellite bus that we're using. RF chain space proven. So what's really disruptive is the way we're putting the architecture together and creating a seamless high highly secure, high-throughput architecture. And, and that's, I think it's a combination of all those things that makes LeoSat a technology disruptor. Well, if Ross, we made you can pronounce that correctly, T-H-A-L-E-S, Talus. Yeah, that's always hard for me. I can't Talus Lenius. Yeah, yes. yeah. So how will these optical networks interface with terrestrial networks? Through the RF signal, or, or will they challenge them in some applications? Um, so, as I said, we're, not, we're using the optical, uh, the lasers on board the satellites to basically provide the backbone. But traffic is, you know, originates in, in the RF form, is converted to a digital signal across the network, and reconverted back to RF to go back down to space. I think they're very complementary. The way I uh, understand uh, your network is going to be ultimately here in 2019 consist of over 100 LEO communication satellites. Are these small cube sats or larger? Or what's, what size are these? Oh, not by any stretch of the imagination. So um, our filing is for 108 uh, low Earth orbit satellites. Uh, the satellites will weigh roughly um, 1,500 kilograms uh, fully fully loaded with fuel. So these aren't CubeSats or microsats by any stretch of the imagination. I believe that the dimensions are roughly you know four meters by three meters. Uh, 80 centimeters deep. So these are these are not what we would consider CubeSats. These are substantial. Yeah, yeah they absolutely. really are. Yeah. Good, good, good. Some of these are constrained by some issues. I don't know if yours are. For example, electrical power, low-gain antennas, and scarcity of available radio spectrum. Will any of these impact your satellites? Well, power is always an issue when you're in space. Um, but because we have a much larger bus, we you know we're sizing the the satellite payload. To, well, actually, the optical addresses yeah. all these issues, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah it, it does. Uh, One, does. two, three. Yeah. So we we'll, don't have to worry about low gain antenna because you're using a laser. Yeah. I, I mean, we'll have four lasers on each satellite. Each laser will be pointed to the next next satellite in the constellation from a north south and east west perspective. Well, this technology is kind of unique, and it will be a boost to the small sat industry. What about players like OneWeb and SpaceX? Are they looking at this technology as well for their small sat constellations? You know, if you look at OneWeb's filing, they are not using inter-satellite optical links. Um, they are using a much more traditional bent pipe uh, architecture. Uh, SpaceX mentioned it in their filing, but there's not a lot of data that you know I could point to that would say definitively they're going to have a, a, an entire constellation that's uh, linked by laser communications. You know, I, I think it all depends upon the market you're going for uh, that determines your architecture. And I think you know OneWeb and, and SpaceX, with their goal of trying to bring internet services to you know the masses of the world, is you know they have the right architecture for those types of services. Um, LeoSat is different. Our, our focus. Focus commercially um, and strategically is on the high-end, high-grade enterprise users who really need robust, large pipes and have a, a need for high security. And and that's why I want to get on here about the commercial customer. Here we are in Washington D.C. sitting here at Satellite 2018. You know, we go across the river. There's there's the military organizations that can purchase a whole lot. So what's your uh, primarily target? Is it mostly commercial target then? Is it government? Or who are you going after? Uh, definitely um, the government. We 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 believe is going to be a big 
um, user of the satellite network, um, but also other commercial and enterprise users. Um, enterprise, oil and glass, all of these, all of these industries that are becoming more and more data. Um, centric and, and larger consumers of data and need big pipes are going to be targets for us. Um, you know, and, and it's not just the amount of data, but really high quality, low latency data. I always like talking about our one of the first customers that we signed up, who is a, in the finance market, a high frequency trader. And the reason they chose us was because our links are faster than terrestrial fiber. Well, I kind of alluded at the Pentagon earlier. I'll uh, dig deeper in here. Uh, one of the generals over the Air Force there talked about the inevitability of um, space uh, combat. <laughs> I don't know how to say this. Contested so, space. Con- yeah, th- yeah, that's a much more delicate word, contested space. You know, and, I mean, wouldn't make, it seems like this would be an I- ideal circumstance for the military to have as space gets more congested. They can send signals cleaner and, and quicker. It just seems almost like a, a, a lead into congested space. <laughs> well, absolutely. And, and, you know, space is becoming a contested area. But, you know, we are launching a constellation of satellites. So we will have more than just one satellite uh, in space, uh, which offers resilience and redundancy. And I think it's very complementary to sovereign geostationary assets that the government may have. Um, And it's always good to have a commercial backup. Well, here we are at uh, Satellite 2018, all kinds of folks walking around here. So who would you like to meet in the show floor here? Anyone in particular? Or what's your goal this afternoon? I always have goals when we go out and meet people at shows like this. (laughs) Well, our goal is, um, you know, uh, we're, we're still a startup company. Um, we have a great initial strategic investor um, in JSAT. Um, we're looking to close out our, our Series A of financing. Um, so, you know, if you have lots of money and you want to spend it on a satellite <laughs> constellation, come talk to me. So you walk around for, hey, you got any money? Hey, you got any money? Talk to me. Yeah. So who is your competitors? Can we see someone from the, from the table here? Who do you compete with? Uh, the cheeky answer is we really don't have any competitors. Uh, this is a fairly unique satellite architecture and constellation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I view OneWeb, SpaceX, and, and O3B and the others as complementary to us. You used to be more, I guess the word would be boutique than, than the, the larger ones. It seems like very, very specific target audience for your... Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we're targeting the top 10% of the, the VSAT market, right? We're not looking at uh, gathering the, you know, the, the bottom 90% of the pyramid. So a uh, company initially started around 2013. And uh, I guess the uh, the network should be completed by about 2022. Does that make sense? Something like that? That's our goal. Um, so next year in Q3, Q4, we'll be launching a Bring Into Use mission. Um, and assuming everything goes well after that, we'll start launching our production satellites in 2020 and hope to complete the constellation by 2022. So... Um what do you think will be the biggest impact we'll have on commercial and military communications? I, I think LeoSat will really redefine how the government architects uh, satellite constellations. You know, I, I think the government will use a combination of geostationary and, and non-geostationary or low-Earth orbit satellites in a, in a unified enterprise way. And I think that'll probably be a very big game changer for us. Would your technology give uh, the people in the Pentagon a strategic advantage in a uh, in a contested area? How's that for discrete? In a contested area, I certainly believe so. Um, you know, it's it's not just one satellite in a plane. Um, if if something were to happen to one of our satellites or, or to a component of one of our satellites, we would be able to reroute through you know our eighty four other satellites in space. You know, when I uh, talk to people about technology and I look forward four or five years, I, I, I just get dizzy with the changes, the amount of new technology taking place there and not knowing what's going to happen. You've already got it planned out to 2022, huh? So, so where do you see it going beyond 2022? I mean... You're pretty confident. <laughs> you can see into the future. <laughs> well, I, I definitely have my views on how I would like to see the next generation of uh, LeoSat. I believe that the cost for access to space is going to be getting much lower. Um, and as a result, we'll be able to refresh the fleet much quicker. We will be able to add very user-specific payloads. Um, to the Constellation at a much quicker pace, increasing capability in space. So I think it's really interesting, and there are a lot of opportunities that we're not really thinking about right now that will present themselves in 2022. Really, because the, actually when it started in 2013, there's been new developments you're applying now, and probably in the next three or four years will be developed to apply in the future beyond that. Yeah, so, absolutely. Oh, great. Well, unfortunately, Michael, we're running out of time here. I'd like to thank our guest, Michael Abad-Santos, Senior Vice President at LeoSat. 
Thanks for listening to Constellations, the podcast from Kratos. If you like this interview, please subscribe, tell a friend, and give us a review. 